Hey kids, welcome to Kyle and Cody's Cult Cinema Cast. Uh, home of the unwanted, the unloved, and the unappreciated. Uh, we have, I'm Kyle. And I'm Cody. And we have a guest here. Hi, I'm Victoria. Yeah, yeah, Victoria Coops. She's a friend of ours. She made the new logo. You're welcome. Yeah, that's very nice. Uh, also yeah. a local uh, unicorn enthusiast. I, yeah. I really don't want to be known as the local <laughs> unicorn girl. Oh, actually... Maybe I do. I don't know. Yeah. We'll decide that by the end of this episode. Yeah. The end yeah. Episode. Speaking of unicorn enthusiasts, we're we're uh, reviewing the last unicorn today. This actually has a way better cast than the last animated film we did, Black Cauldron. It's got yes. like uh, Christopher Lee is one of the bigger names. Yep, Christopher Lee. I like him. He plays the bad guy, the main bad guy in this. Maya Farrow. Maya Farrow. Jeff Bridges plays one of the guys. He actually stated that he would come in and work on this movie for free. That's how enthusiastic he was about having that in his resume because of the, like, the author beforehand was so prestigious, I guess, from this book Mm -hmm. that he felt... Well, and what my understanding was was that this movie, The Last Unicorn, was such a strong script and, like, concept, and it was kind of something that hadn't been done. It's very, like, it... It's a fantasy, obviously, but it deviates from a lot of what you see with Disney fantasy. And so I think everyone was really excited because, it, yeah, it has a lot of really good actors. And they do a good job in the in the voice work, I think. Yeah. Uh, we also got Alan Arkin playing Smendrick, the male lead. Angela Lansbury plays a female villain. Molly Gerb? No. no Tammy uh, Grimes. Yeah. She, yeah, uh, Angela Lansbury plays... Uh, Molly Fortuna, Don Messick, people might have heard of him, Robert Klein, I think that's a guy. So, yeah, there's that. The movie had a budget of somewhere around $3 million, and, uh, or $3.5 million made like 6.5, so it didn't quite make profit, like we've discussed before, the uh, movies need to double their budget in box office, so it's... Not too bad, but not a financial success, really. But uh, it has quite a bit of call following. It has a lot more positive reception compared to what you get from Black Cauldron. Yeah, it's a little bit different from the ones that you've done so far on the cast. And I think what makes it a cult film is that when people love it, they really love it. Like, you talk to anyone who really loves this movie, and they've got nothing uh, bad to say yeah. about it. And that's a, that's one thing I've noticed in retrospect that was different from uh, Black Cauldron. Is like people are like, "Oh yeah, Black Cauldron," but this is like people that like Last Unicorn. This is like one of their favorite movies. Yeah, I didn't really know. What, I, I'd never seen this before. I didn't really know what I was going to get get with it. I didn't know if it was going to be like a Totoro situation where like the t- the named character isn't really a big character in this or if it was going to be like a big deal or if it was just going to be a... I didn't know that the Air Unicorn was going to be a speaking role or any of that. So yeah, I didn't really know what, what I was getting into going into it. I didn't expect the, uh, as much music in it as like that there was and that was yeah. really... I literally was like, I got up halfway through because when a, mu- like a movie doesn't spark my interest really fast. I kind of just kind of coast through it. And I got up at one point in time and uh, used the washroom and go for a smoke and Victoria's watching it with me. And I left during a musical to come back directly before a musical started. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, it's, not, it's not quite a... I don't know if I'd call it quite a musical. There are musical numbers in it, but it's not a every plot point. And a lot of the musical is done by... Uh, the people of America. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, th- yeah. They do a bunch of the music in this. Uh, any other things that's not sung by explicitly one of the characters is done by the band America, and they do a pretty good job. I knew there was. I think it's maybe just one song they do, and they split it up between the three parts. I'm not sure. Well, I think they had a hand in either recording or writing the yeah. other parts too, because it, it was actually. Um, it was marketed as a, like, children's musical Disney-ish, but not Disney, um, movie, in the States at least, in, in North America, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, I think, but, like, I've seen The Last Unicorn more times than I can count. I literally couldn't give you a number, because when I was a kid, my sister, Moira, 
uh, she she made me watch it at least like four times a day, probably for a year. So I don't know what the math is on that, but I've seen this movie so many times, which definitely biased my approach to watching it this time. Because as an adult, it's a different perspective, but I had all these memories of just being forced by my little sister <laughs> to sit down and watch The Last Unicorn. If you're looking for a unicorn enthusiast, it might be Moira. Yeah. Maybe we should call her up. <laughs> uh. Yeah, it's a fair bit different than what we're uh, getting. It, this is also based on a book by uh, Peter S. Beagle, who also wrote the screenplay. Screenplay. So that's a nice little bit of continuity there, and you get a, at least with you're doing that, you're usually getting a similar feel. So yeah. with that being said, with him also writing the screenplay, he wrote the screenplay to the 1987 um, Hobbit film. It came. You said it came out before this. This is 1982. This is 1977. 1977. Okay. Yeah. And it's also done by the same uh, studio, Rock and Bass. Aggregates are giving it about 70% ratings. 90% to 92% of Google users like this film. I don't honestly yeah. understand how Google users rate things. I think it's just a thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, it's it's just a thumbs up. Thumbs it really down. doesn't make sense, though, to me, though, because yeah. you look at other movies that yeah. are not great, uh, and they've got like a 92 Based on Google users, and I call yeah. bullshit. Yeah, Google users is just a general approval rating. It's not an aggregate. Just what it, I just I only really bring it up because it's occasionally useful when it's up on the thing. What I just like is going through like Rotten Tomato, uh, what you call it? Yeah, Rotten Reviews Tomatoes is the, the worst. They have like all the like big prestigious like the AV Club or like the New York Times. And they're all going in and like, this was my professional write-up. I do this for free, right? Mm. So, <laughs> New York Times, hit me up. <laughs> wow, that, that subtle, shameless <laughs> plug. Somebody's got to For it. <laughs> the New York Times. Yeah. I, hey, I kind of think it's fun. Print that. news is dying, Victoria, and we need to save it. Oh yeah, I'm a writer. <laughs> and this is a job, saving print news is a job for Cody Upton. <laughs> a podcaster. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I kind of think it's interesting that I'm uh, the one who's maybe more like familiar with this movie. It's uh, one that you guys haven't mm. watched before, I don't know, today. Yeah. Well, it yeah. seems to be marketed to younger girls more than... It's in theory, at least. In theory, yeah. I think we could have a real... I know the one guy I um, hear the most about this movie of in the past. Uh, the singer Danny Sexbang's a big fan of it. You know, this probably started the brony age. Like, this was the... Every little brother of every girl who watched this is now a brony. I that That's my <laughs> prediction for The Last Unicorn and I would male know. audience. <laughs> not into the brony. just not showing it. I, I like watching uh, grown men critique the show. It's kind of funny. Well, and I like. I think that it is more adult than it is. Uh, well, it, it, it originally yeah. started out as an adult um, movie, and then they took it and then geared it towards kids. So, which is a lot of a reality of animation in the uh, in the West. It's just not a typically drawn for grown-ups or it's not like in japan where you can get a good fielding of mature rated animated content mm -hmm. and it was just for whatever reason it never picked up on the idea that you can put all the violence you want in a animated show and it's which to yeah. me is really stupid because if they were to take a movie like this that has this animated style and geared it towards like for example, uh, the Swords of Shunner offer, they recently redid, but they gave the rights to MTV, and MTV <laughs> should not have the rights to anything. Um, they're a music television, they should make music, or music videos. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> but I guess the interesting fact with this, and kind of going off of what Kyle had said already, was that this was animated in Japan, so there's another yeah. element to it. Like, of course, the the screenplay and the storyline was already there, quite mature, with just some mature themes. But then it was outsourced from the United States to Japan and animated there. So then that art style, um, which is one of the things that I actually loved about yeah. watching this movie this time around. Um, I really appreciated the animation mm -hmm. and was pleased to find out that it was done in Japan by the studio that would later become Studio Ghibli. And I am like 
a fanatic about everything Studio Ghibli. So that was kind of fun. Made me like this movie a and little bit more. And one thing I will say, I don't know if I'd really, like, not, as not a person who's being hired to a- advertise this in the 1980s, but I don't know if I'd call this even, I, I don't know if I'd call this a kid's movie based on uh, the themes. There's a lot of, you gotta know a bit about mythology to kind of get where this is going and thing. I'll talk about that a bit more later, but I, I don't know if I'd call this a kid's movie. It's not like the Black Cauldron where, like, clear this was a- addressed at kids where it's like a story time thing. This has kind of got, like, a bunch of fairly thick amounts of lore on it and, like, old-style lore. I don't mean that in, like, the modern sense where, like, uh, Star Wars or Marvel has lore. It's like a mythology background and it's very, it's very different than kind of like one of that what you get from older fantasy before it's all before you get uh, a lot of it being very derivative of Tolkien. Yeah, Tolkien remakes. This yeah. is very unique, and I think that's one of the reasons it's so beloved by people who uh, were younger when it was released, and maybe not the target audience, but then grew up to love it and love it as adults, right? Which, I'm not sure I'm one of those people, but maybe this is a good time to kind of get into the meat of the yeah. conversation and look at, like... The plot and the yeah, story. Yeah, I think we'll get. Yeah, I think we'll start the plot here. Um, it opens with a couple, a pair of hunters who are uh, hunting for exposition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they um, arrive in a forest and are starts by talking about uh, how they're not finding any game. And the older of the two gentlemen says that they won't find any game because this uh, area is under the protection of unicorns or something to that effect. And he, as they leave, he shouts into the background. He's like. Yeah, take care, beast. You're the last. You're you're the last one. And then we cut to our protagonist, the last unicorn. Which was really rude of him. I just want to. I just want to yeah. point that out. Like rude. You can't just waltz into someone's home and be like, "You're the last of your kind. Deal with it. Bye." Yeah. And um, that. Yeah. That, and and also, sorry, Kyle. Yeah. Also, even before that, even before that, I was so ready to give this movie a chance because. From my childhood, I just I hated it the whole time. And even as we were getting ready to do the podcast, I was not excited to rewatching it. I was actually really excited to tear it to shreds, which I think we're going to do a little bit of. But then I wanted to give it a fair shot. So sat down with Cody to watch it and thinking like, okay, open mind, don't be biased. As soon as that first credit song came on, as soon as it came on, I was just right back to <laughs> nine-year-old Victoria, and I hated it. I felt like my sister had tied me to a chair, which she probably did, and was forcing me to watch it. So even before we get to the like two guys hunting in the forest, explaining what's going on in the world, uh, I had already felt those feelings of deep, deep hatred. What's the opposite of nostalgia? I don't know, but whatever it is, I have it. I don't know. Historical literacy? I don't know if it's historical I think, I think if, if uh, I were to ever write uh, any form of literature, I just want to have two random f- hunters just giving all my exposition for me at this point. That you never see again. Yeah. They just yeah. show up and you never see them again. Yeah, it's they're weirdly not relevant to the plot. They... The other person who gives a lot of exposition in the beginning was also the butterfly that just randomly yeah. floats over we'll get the to that. cord. Uh, right. But yeah, after the hunters say their bit, we get the unicorn we see, and it's, she's in the magic forest, and she's uh, questioning what they said. She's like, that can't be the last unicorn. I haven't seen any other unicorns in, like, forever. But there's no... That's weird to think I'm the last one. How about what that even happened? Yeah, point of uh, point of order, Kyle. Your voice isn't nearly echoey and whispery enough for her inner voice. So, <laughs> could you say that all again, more <laughs> like the last unicorn? Yeah, she's got she's got a certain echoey, uh, annoying voice. Come on, yeah. come on, <laughs> give the give the people what they want, Kyle. They uh, want to hear you try to talk like the last my, unicorn. My best Mia Farrow impression. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, that's what this is about. I can't do it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it's it's very very echoey. Yeah. It's like, oh no, I'm having an existential crisis about being the last of my kind, like yeah. like that, and annoying. Isn't there a, an old um, horror story that goes along the lines of you're the last man on earth? 
and you're in a house and you hear a knock on the door. That's kind of the situation that's going on here. Back mm -hmm. onto the anime style, like uh, an animation style of this movie. Her eyes are weirdly, uh, for the lack of a better word, fuckity. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know if they're just trying to mimic a horse, but like, whenever you. I don't know. They're, they're magical. Yeah, there's a point. Okay. There's some point about not. A plot point about them not being able to see stuff in the eyes of unicorns or they're not reflective of there is yeah. so much going on in terms of lore and plot oh, yeah. points <laughs> and unanswered questions in the whole yeah. movie and like i can see what they're trying to do the book was probably very i've never read it disclaimer i've never yeah. read the book but i'm assuming that it was very imaginative very creative and world building right now mm -hmm. you're trying to boil that down into a an hour and a half feature film well, they're kind of missing the mark in a lot of those ways because there's that eye thing where it's like, can you see the past of the unicorns in her eyes or something? I don't know. At least um, it's not as bad as 2001 A Space Odyssey where they don't explain anything to you. Oof. I, I Like 2001 A Space Odyssey, the book, is like this really interesting thing where you like learn empathy for like these strange aliens and like two, two thousand. the movie is just like a bunch of paint splotches on the film. For, it's like... I'm not a cinematography buff, so this movie doesn't do any... The movie didn't do anything for me. But, like, the book is, like, one of my favorite books of all time. Maybe my favorite novel. This is turned into a Kyle and Cody and Victoria's uh, review of favorite novels yeah. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got my two cents in here. Um, I, I don't have a favorite novel. He's one of those people that can't choose his favorite because he loves too many books, like, who just cops out and he's like, oh, I love so many books, I read so much, I'm so... I don't actually read a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, after, <laughs> uh, after the unicorn's talking to herself for a bit, um, a butterfly comes along and starts singing randomly. And this is the part of the movie where I was like, okay, I enjoy this. You. This is what convinced you that you enjoyed it, <laughs> Kyle. What is wrong with you? He's this a masochist. Is, he he enjoys the, this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this. I, Kyle, you, were, do you like being you were tied talk, up. Like? <laughs> you were talking earlier, and you mentioned. I don't remember if this What's is in the podcast on or not. Wax. <laughs> but I. I don't remember. <laughs> What you if this was in the podcast enough, but you were talking about how much you hate the butterfly, and then I just like had a spark, like a spark in my mind. I was like, oh, she's gonna be mad at me when she figures it, when I tell her that I like I the butterfly. I am mad at you, and I do think you're a masochist also, and into bondage. Was, because... it, was it just me, or was the ma like was the wow was the butterfly wearing sunglasses? Yes, okay. and a little scarf, and <laughs> yeah. did you pay for some? Yeah, the butterfly has like a lot of uh, anachronistic songs that he sings. And, like, at some point during these songs, he uh, gives out some uh, rumor about what's happening to all the unicorns. I can't. I'm sorry. Let's, let's just. I can't believe that the butterfly is what convinced you that this was a worthwhile <laughs> movie to watch. Because the butterfly, like, sorry, he, like, fucks over the timeline. He's, like, singing songs that aren't medieval, for one thing. <laughs> he's, like, spouting off poetry that hasn't been written yet. And he's annoying. Like, what is with like, animated movies and blue insects that are supposed to be, like, sage, bard-like creatures. I'm thinking of Alice in Wonderland and the Caterpillar, and mm -hmm. I'm just like, no, no more blue insects. Not worth it. It's not working. Uh, uh, hookah smoking. <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know. I, I liked it. It was kind of, like, uh, weirdly off-the-wall charming. It's Okay. Yeah. I will give you my comprehensive list of reasons why you shouldn't like the butterfly character. One, like I said, he fucks up the timeline. Two, he's a flat earther because he is like, chase the unicorns to the ends of the earth. Sorry, dude, the earth is round, not flat. Also, he wears a beret and shades, and he only talks in song lyrics. Who plays? He is basically the uh, real world equivalent of a hipster. Actually, if he <laughs> plays him. Is the butterfly's name Rook or Marb? I don't know Marb if he has a name. I don't think he's uh, important enough. Yeah. yeah. I don't know who played him. He might him. have just been called the butterfly. Yeah. yeah. I forget what he was called in the movie. But yeah, he, Even it, the unicorn doesn't like the butterfly. She's all like, you are a silly butterfly. Well, yeah, he's all cryptic I, I love, and shit. I would love to see somebody at the, like, the, at the start of the film have like this exact same scene and then just like 
Oh, okay. Thanks for that information. Smush. <laughs> <laughs> the hunters come back to reprise their role, and they they step on the butterfly. Oh, here's a here's a statement I thought of that's going to turn the the entire audience against me, and maybe everyone in this room against me. It's I think it's like uh, Robin Williams' performance, the Jimmy, but less up its own ass. I don't like it. Really? Yeah, I don't. You care. like this I, as much as you like Robin Williams in Aladdin? I don't really like Aladdin. <laughs> Okay, so you like this more than you like yeah. Robin Williams in yeah, Aladdin? It's, it's wow. not it's not a whole movie of it, which is the thing. I can't I'm not like a So this is this is now it. called Victoria and Cody's Roast Kyle podcast. <laughs> because you're you're out to lunch, dude. <laughs> like this butterfly is is yeah. not a good part of this movie. Yeah. He's the worst part of this movie. Yeah. It gets better from here, but but I can't believe that this I, is what I gave do you the side. I, I do side with the butterfly. I even have a point uh, point in my notes where it's just like uh, the unicorn being like sort of racist to the butterfly. He's like, "What does butterflies know?" That's fair. The, the unicorn doesn't show her yeah. good colors for I don't know maybe the entire movie. She's a yeah. little she's a little uppity and I, she's a little. I see the point of like people not liking this, but I'm kind of on board with it. <laughs> okay, yeah. well. In order to maintain my friendship with Kyle, we're going to have to move on because I I might just leave or okay. make him leave. Yeah, um, the unicorn then sets off on a quest to find the other unicorns because she there's got to be more around. So she checks out the other forests, leaving uh, all the animals behind, which is maybe semi-reckless because it's kind of implied that uh, she protects the forest in some way. Or at least her presence is like magically beneficial to the forest. Yeah, and and she goes off on this really impulsive quest to go find the other unicorns with, like, no information. She's like, oh, they're being chased by a red bull to the ends of the earth. Again, the earth is not flat. Um, and, and she just, like, starts going in a direction. She has no idea which direction she's going until she meets... And also, we don't know how long she's on on this journey. No, it just... Because oh. it's... We see her going through a bunch of... Uh, I'm not sure if she's going through a bunch of different climates... Or she's just running that long. She might have been gone on this journey for years. That's yeah. not that's not a possibility. I'm prepared to discount. There was winter scenes in that. Yep, I, I, I know think what it's he's a time saying. lapse thing. I think he. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, I want to uh, circle back to <laughs> yes. So they took the Red Bull because Red Bull uh, ran all the unicorns to the end of the earth. Where was she during this? Yeah, yeah I guess, that's never. Answered. I guess, Yeah, I guess she also, was just also, missed. Yeah, okay, but the, like she was there because they keep on showing her having like PTSD, like Vietnam flashbacks of like. Oh, I hadn't thought about right. that, but that's that's fair. She does get these like weird visions of the Red Bull that are chasing unicorns. I could, just, be that, could be she saw it when she was really young. We don't know how long she's been alone. Or, or I assumed it was magic, like that. Be, yeah. That as the story was revealed to her, she was getting these magic premonitions. It is kind of cerebral, where like you're seeing stuff that's maybe not necessarily literally on the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she's on this journey for a little bit, and this uh, first encounter with a human she gets, we learn a couple things. We learn that first of all, uh, generally speaking, men can't uh, tell the difference between a unicorn and a regular horse. So, like, if a man sees a unicorn, he will just see a pretty horse, essentially. A they... pretty mare, a white yeah. mare. And when the poor farmer that sees her and tries to take her to to the market because she's a beautiful mare, uh, takes off his belt, she gets all indignant. She's like, a horse? You think I'm a horse? <laughs> and... It is weird that she objects to that, because I don't think the terminology is different for unicorns. Unless it is. I don't know. Much well, she unicorns. gets real, like, objective and real, like, the guy also... her hair. And the butterfly told her that. The butterfly literally said, people don't see you as a unicorn. They see you as a mare. In he some... was also trying to capture her and sell her. Against That's fair. Her no, well, I, so... totally, <laughs> yeah. I totally, I totally, I don't, I don't approve of that. Uh, I don't approve of the sale of magical creatures or animals. But I also think that she was a little bit, you know, indignant for no reason because it's also keeping her safe. If they don't think that she's a unicorn, they're not hunting her for being a unicorn. On that, are they hunting magical creatures? No, I don't think... Uh, the king is, and we haven't okay. gotten to him yet. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the circus lady. Which, we're, yeah, we're getting to that next. 
Um, after she evades this uh, random farmer, she's resting on the side of the road after some more time passes, and a, and this uh, witch notices her. And being a woman, she does notice that she's a that there's a unicorn. So she walks up. She calls over two guys. Who's one guy's? I guess her son or something. Uh, some guy who helps her with her uh, caravan, which we which we will soon learn is a traveling circus or zoo, however you want to put it, and. Also, like a freak show, like, yeah, like mm-hmm. an oddity and freak show, yeah. I think. Yeah, magical zoo, and then uh, sh- we're also introduced to the male lead. Yay, uh, Smendrick. <laughs> maybe the one saving grace of yeah. this movie. He he kind of and he just like maybe lies about not noticing the unicorn. So this is an exception to the rule that uh, I think magical people have the ability to see unicorns yeah, which, without the illusion. Yeah. When I I remember thinking that that was the reason the witch could see yeah. her too was because yeah. one she was a woman but she also was a witchy woman mm-hmm. and so that helped her yeah. be able to identify the real unicorn and it wasn't clear to me that Schmendrick could tell it was her until later when he goes to talk to her and I was so confused about why he was talking to the white mare mm-hmm. because he just all of a sudden appears and is like I know what you are but it's not explained that he could see her. Yeah, his so. motives aren't. This movie is doesn't spell things out for you. Yeah, there's and a it lot is, of it is questions. you. It is usual. It is usually good enough to give you enough vi- uh, visual clues to pick up on what's going on, but not always. So you don't uh, totally know what uh, Smendrick's motives are here when he lies about not being able to see the unicorn, but he does. I guess see the unicorn or realizes it a little later, and he goes to, and then the witch uh, puts the keeps the unicorn asleep with a spell, and then they capture the unicorn, uh, the last unicorn, put her into a cage, and we're introduced to the carnival, which uh, it appears to have actual monsters in it, but it turns out the witch is just using illusions to make it look like uh, they have actual monsters by making, granted, already exotic animals look like monsters like this is a woman in like medieval europe and she has a monkey she has a lion but she's like oh yeah they need to look like a manticore and other stuff but there is one more other magical creature in here there's a uh harpy which she has also captured by chance like she captured the unicorn who and so yeah there's two magical creatures and this is actually I i like this interaction she has with the harpy it's like yeah i've caught her yeah she's gonna kill me the second she gets out but yeah, I'm comfortable with that. She, because you know what, I'm going. My, she's actually immortal. My immortality comes from being the one from that creature fearing, having nightmares about me for the rest of her life. Kind of like, not unlike the Dark Knight Returns, where Batman just holds up Superman, just like, remember me, I was the man who beat you. <laughs> yeah, fair. Yeah. It's the whole, the whole like Mummy Fortuna's traveling caravan thing scene. I understand why, because we have to meet Schmendrick and we have to progress the qu- progress the quest further. But it also scared me as a kid. Oh, yeah. The whole scene was terrifying. And so as an adult, when I was sitting down to watch this this afternoon, I was I was still afraid. I was still freaked out because that harpy is scary and oh, Mommy yeah. Fortuna is scary. And then... Yeah, this is a very graphic harpy. It's not like a... She's got like three boobs, dude. Yeah, three like drooping, horrifying looking... Hey, hey, no (laughs) boob shaming here, guys. No, fair enough. Uh, But yeah, it's not the harpy lady, the Yu-Gi-Oh card. No, no. I haven't spoken in a while, and I'd like to say I'm still here. And uh, (laughs) I'd like to bring up the fact that she pointed... They're looking around the carnival, and they're like, these are all of my pets that I've got, or whatever, you know. Yeah, you can tell Cody really (laughs) watched this movie closely. But but they pointed to, like... And they're like, and that's a satyr. And it showed, like, this weird looking, like, from where the wild things are, almost. Mm. Like, (laughs) like, creature. And I'm like, I thought a satyr just had, like, horses, like, or bottom hats. Yes, it's really... all this stuff is like really demonic, grim yes. uh, depictions of monsters. 
It's not the glorified versions. Think more, I guess, Clash of the Titans, original Clash of the Titans, than, uh, I don't know, I don't know what you'd compare it to. It's not yeah. Disney. Yeah, it's, it's not. No. It's yeah. more authentic medieval monsters, yeah. which I, yeah. I like, I enjoy, and as an adult think it adds to the story but yeah. as a kid again it was traumatic it was scary yeah. I, I again argue this is too uh, dense to be a kids movie in a lot of places this and being also, one of them also, i like yeah. uh the fact that um mommy fortuna i think that's i'm pronouncing that right i like the fact that she has like a crow's nest like on top of her head like she's just carrying around a perch for a crow to sit in yeah, if I was going to be an elderly witch woman, I think I would have a perch hat for my magical bird. I think it would be a parrot, though. What is this rated? I don't know. It's, it's probably it's like probably PG. PG at best. But rating. Like, That's a good question. I have no clue. Yeah. Um, well, was this before the rating system? Yeah, it might have been. If it would have been. No, I don't think it's before the rating system. Um, What's the website? Rating. Common Sense Media gives you ratings. Uh, uh Common sense is saying age is nine and up. Parents, I guess it's PG. Yeah, I I think it it must be PG, but it is like I said. Oh, it, um, oh no, it's rated oh, G. Oh no, I have it. Uh, I think originally TV United States TV rating is TV fourteen. Um, United, I think uh the original movie rating was G, but that's what, uh in a very different time of G rating. This is before they have the PG rating, definitely. Right. So this would um. That's in the era, era before you have, uh, you can get away with a lot more stuff in the G rating. Before, yeah, so this is very Well, different. even at that, if it, if it's, um, it had breasts. Like, yeah. straight on exposed breasts. That's mm. not like. But yeah, this is. Normally allowed in G rated movies. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. think today it's ever allowed in G rated movies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can, it's pre, I think it's pre PG rating, but it's, uh, rated TV 14 for TV. So I'm Which, gonna go by that. I think that's the most accurate. That makes the most sense. Because I think even if you like it, ignore the nudity, it is I think too generally too dense for a child to. Yeah, I don't really have understand. any. I don't have any problem with like people seeing boobs and nudity yeah. and whatnot. Especially it's, yeah. considering it's on a monster. Like if there was just a naked woman on TV, she would she be... was naked. When she, yeah. like, later on, she's naked. So yeah. there, there is some nudity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you could easily but like, draw some extra stuff there, and that probably would have gotten you know, maybe an R in the time, but... Yeah, but but I... I It's more the content. Like, it, yeah. it's more to do with the content. And this scene where, and I think we're getting there, where after she's been captured and Smendrick, <laughs> the magician, I love his name. I think I'm going to name my firstborn that. Because that's, like, little shmemmy... <laughs> My my magic child. Oh, my, my Tyler. <laughs> yeah, my my husband's not gonna go for that. I'll tell yeah. you that right now. But if if he does, I'll I'll donate a lot of money to this podcast. <laughs> okay, uh, we're we're gonna hold you yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, on to the plot again. Unicorn has a fair bit of sympathy for the heartbeat, being that they're both in prison. Kind of. I mean, maybe the harpy should generally and be in prison if mythology gives us anything but a goodbye. I love harpies. I think yeah. they're fantastic. Yeah. Can you throw mythical creatures in prison? This is this would be a fun question. Well, and that <laughs> actually kind of lands on some of the other themes going on in this movie, like environmentalism and like animal rights. Is it's actually a huge theme throughout the movie, and so. I, I really love that the unicorn and the harpy have this kind of bond. Like they're the, yeah. she says we're we're the opposite sides of the same magic, and I think that's where her compassion is coming from. Yeah. One of the moments that I actually liked her because I struggle with liking the last unicorn as a character, and then when she turns into a human girl, like it's all over the place, and I'm not sure if I enjoy her. But this I, moment of compassion is actually really strong. I do appreciate the morality here. Being that she treats, uh, we'll get into this a little bit when she is, uh, eventually does escape from this. But she does have like a kind of an attitude where she's like, "No, she's not going to attack me. I haven't done anything to her." And frankly, even if maybe in normal circumstances, but right now she's going to. Second, she gets out, she's going to go for uh, Mama Fortuna. Later in the night, uh, Smendrick does work to 
try to free the unicorn to free the unicorn. He is a bit of a bad wizard. He doesn't have great control of his spells. He can do stuff, but not but not necessarily stuff that helps him per se. Like he's able to shrink the cage, which doesn't do anything. This is actually one of the best moments in the whole movie because he I don't know Cody if you want to speak to this, but this is the moment where he shrinks the cage and then he just pulls out those keys. Yeah. He's like, I might be a second-rate magician, but I'm a first-rate lockpick, and he <laughs> whips out a set of keys, and I'm just like, well, why didn't you just start with the fact that you had the keys? I do like, like the fantasy dialogue in this. It's not always easy to do, but this does do good with its fantasy dialogue, where no one's quite talking normal except for Jess Bridges. But yeah, the, he eventually frees him. The unicorn moves on to free everyone else. She does eventually just free the harpy, too. And, uh... By the way, the way that she frees him is she just starts ramming her horn into random blocks, yeah. which magically unlocks him. But, like, we never hear, like, oh, this unicorn has magical lockpicking abilities. She's with a its fucking unicorn yeah, guy! Kind of, but, like, <laughs> to, she's, she's although, like... on that note... She can unlock the other guy's uh, locks, but she can't do hers. Her lock is on the outside of her cage. She can't reach her. How does it matter? She's just the... you got to put it up because to the edge of the lock. Because magic has to have rules. How I'm going to kick? explain this to you guys right now. No, it doesn't. It clearly does not yes, have to have does. rules. Magic because there was never any predecessor to the fact that the unicorn has magical horn unlocking abilities. Well, unless you're going to have an exposition. Device plot device where they're just like, oh, we need her to get out of these cages. How are we going to do that? Oh, magical horn unlocking abilities. <laughs> Unless you're going to have, like, some sort of expi <coughs> exposition, I don't know, like, um, centipede come up and explain why <laughs> she has magical powers and how they work. You don't know the rules of the magic until it's done. So that would be one of my suggestions is that her magic is limited by physical barriers, my, like wood and doors, and that's why she couldn't open her My best door. guess is she can only use her magic to help others. That's the impression I'm getting by based on uh, she's able to unlock these locks, but she's not even able to unlock hers, and later on in the movie she uses her magic to help another person, but I don't think she can use it for personal gain. That makes more sense, is, too. That's my best guess, anyway. Maybe Kyle's the book smarter. explains it. Uh, yeah, I'm okay at figuring this. Yeah, anyway, so the, the Harpy's freed. Smendrick's all scared, but uh, Harpy tells him, don't run from immortals. It only no, no. attracts their attention. The the unicorn says, yeah. don't run from yeah, no, immortals. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Um, yeah, the unicorn, uh, Smendrick's scared, but the unicorn points out to him, don't run from immortals. The uh, running attracts their attention. And they calmly walk away, and then the harpy goes after the witch. And eats her. Again, another image that is going to be impressed in my, like, childhood psyche for the rest of my life is this image of the harpy's winged back, like, feasting on Mama Fortuna mm -hmm. behind the harpy. And Schmendrick and the unicorn are walking away, and she's like, don't look back, just keep walking. Yeah. And the harpy's like, rah, 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 yeah. eating and flapping her wings. And it was scary. Yeah. There is no actual blood in this, though, so... No, there's yeah. no blood, but the implication yeah. of her ripping the old witch's flesh from uh, her yeah. bones Again, is there. Again, this movie is a couple extra, like, maybe like 20, like, a couple hours of animation away from being a good bit higher rating. I wonder if there is a copy of it out there that is, like, like the X-rated yeah. version Some of. sort of uh, edit on there. Where yeah, you get, um, blood so, and guts. Yeah, he... She asks uh, Smendrick about the Red Bull, and he just says, yeah, there's tons of rumors. I can't tell you anything for sure. Uh, different people say different things. And what we learn about them later, it makes sense, because uh, they're really isolated where the Red Bull is. And Red Bull and the Red Bull apparently works for a guy named King Haggard, or uh, as Smendrick's saying, maybe the Red Bull has Haggard captured. We never really do learn an origin for the Red Bull, which isn't necessarily important. I don't think it's, for the style of story, I don't think it's important that we know what the Red Bull's deal is. I just like how this movie that has writers is like, eh, 
you know, let's just, you know, we don't know about anything that's going on currently in this universe. It's like, like hearsay, you know? So let's just call it in. Just gloss it over. <laughs> yeah, just exactly. gloss over that part. I do think it gives it a little bit of a uh, air of mysticism. Or like... <laughs> It does make every scene seem a little bit more magical that yeah, they but it's, it's uh, just discover like, what's going yeah, on. Yeah, fill in the blanks yourself. You know, you make your own story at this point. I'm, <laughs> I'm just now realizing that Kyle is one of those people. He's watched The Last Unicorn once, and now he's one of those people that if you say anything bad about it, he is going to defend it. It's like his new favorite animated meant for adults made for kids movie <laughs> of all time i'm getting I mean, it if you, if you will s if you ever if we ever get around to seeing me review some star wars you'll get the same issue you'll see the same side of me where i just talk about where i like go really deep into the implicated lore and whatnot and nothing is wrong with any of it yep. it's interesting to me um because like i said earlier I don't love the unicorn's character. I find her not likable for most of the film. One of the points that I don't like her is when Schmendrick, right after he frees her and kind of saves her and they walk away from that visceral, disgusting scene, she kind of says, well, thank you for helping me. What can I do for you? And he's like, you can't give me what I truly want. And she's like, yes, I can't turn you into something you're not. And then he says, I'm, uh, oh no, what does he, he says, I, I don't, he says, don't worry about it. That's what it is. He mm -hmm. says, don't worry about it. And she's like, I'm not. And just like walks <laughs> yeah. away from him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she's a weird mist. Uh, you do get the sense that she's, this is a difficult thing that a lot of people have where they uh, go to these magical creatures where they're just humans, but different. But this thing, uh, but the, the last unicorn does seem vaguely alien. She's not treated like a human. She doesn't have human emotions. Where she experiences yeah. them differently, which, yeah. again, I can see, and it's working. I just want her to be more yeah. likable as yeah. we do that. But again, I pointed out something that I didn't love about The Last Unicorn, and Kyle corrected it! <laughs> and He's defended a it. girl! <laughs> Um, yeah, our next scene, we meet uh, uh, Fat Robin Hood, who's a character I kind of like. And the fun thing about this is he's like, he's like oh yeah, uh, yeah, he get the Smendrick gets captured by this fat Robin Hood? I say that because it it's I get he gets really captured captive. but he's with the guys and it doesn't appear that he's in any real danger but Smendrick acts as if he's endangered. Fat Robin, uh, what's the guy? Hold on, I can find the guy's name real quick. I like just calling him Fat Robin because <laughs> that's kind of what he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, King Lori? No. no. No, Uh, Captain, 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 Cast. Is he really a captain, though? He's like a, a, a guy who runs a band of outlaws. Does that uh, make him a captain? Captain Cully. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Captain Cully, he's um, sort of a Robin Hood-type vigilante. And he uh, gets seemingly welcomes Smendrick into the full, into his crew for a little bit to get some food. We meet, uh, I guess, our, fe our secondary female lead, uh, Molly Grew, who's... Mm -hmm. I guess Captain Collie's girlfriend, wife maybe. Yeah. I love her. Yeah. I, I she's, don't know if they're married. They don't like. He's a brigand. That might be a very informal yeah. thing. It seems like a the boss's girl mm -hmm. again. Little Victoria's eight-year-old brain definitely made them married. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and twenty-five-year-old Victoria's adult brain kept them married because. I'm still processing yeah. all the times I watched it, like the 90 times growing up. It's entirely the possible. The implication is, yeah. it's, it's... Um, they be banging. Yeah. But, I mean, they are doing that. That, that is a thing. Is it's just not clear whether they're married stated. or not. But yeah, they, uh, Captain Cully tells his uh, bard character in his crew that he wants him to tell some stories about him. And, she's, and the crew's just like, nah, tell some stories about Robin Hood. And he's like, Robin Hood's a myth. Which is a weird <laughs> statement in this movie. It's just like, Wait, so harpies are real, unicorns are real, there's spectral, giant spectral bulls, much of like, we see dragon later in the movie, and, but Robin Hood's... Off the table. Yeah, he's like, and he's still, his myth still exists in this world, which is a weird thing. I, I think it's meant to be kind of one of the illusions yeah. that we're pulling from, right? Because yeah. this is, in a lot of ways, the mirror side, or like the shadow side of 
those fairy tales that are so idealistic, Robin Hood. So now we're seeing the reality of what a band of thieves is living like in the forest, and it's not as glamorous. And oh, one of the reasons I love Molly is because she's a romantic at her heart, and she went away thinking that this was going to be her Robin Hood adventure. Obviously, the world has not been kind to this poor woman, and she's like jaded and bitter. And then this happens with the yeah. magician and the and the unicorn. But yeah, Smendrix uses his power to create a ghost of Robin Hood, which uh, he uses to lure away the thing. And he wasn't in danger before this, but it, but uh, Captain Cully realizes what he's done and then ties him to a tree, <laughs> making him in danger. Also, he says, magic, do as you will, which I would like to give you guys a hot tip about magic. Don't give it free reign. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't just to the powers of the universe say, do as you will, because then you have no intention behind it and no direction. And it's like, Schmendrick, come on, come on, buddy. Like, you're smarter yeah. than this. I know you can do better. I don't know that yeah, he but is. that's kind of that's kind of Smendrick's character. <laughs> Smendrick's a Smendrick. He just Smendrick's things at this point. Like, he just used his name <laughs> as like a noun and, and an a adjective I and a verb. All I am at very once. talented. But yeah, he he gets uh, lashed to a tree and uh, uses his magic to make what a make a make the tree into a lady tree kyle uh, what was your what was your impression about this scene did this scene make you buy in as well like the fucking butterfly at the beginning <laughs> this was this was weird all i could think about is just like what is with like i talked a little bit in the like the black cauldron of you about how like you can just stick people between uh people between cleavage and kids movies and it's apparently fine yeah and they do this again in the booby in the booby tree kind of molests them yeah, and he's like, and she's like, I'll love you forever, and you're mine. And then she gets jealous of the unicorn literally just walking into the circle it's a of very grass. It's a very feminine tree, clearly, yeah. but it's a very masculine voice on this tree. Like, it's, it's a little bit deeper, a little husky. Yeah. 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 Anyways, I was going to bring this up because they did talk quickly about the tree having some form of understanding of the world before that. I've always liked the idea, especially in D&D, about giving something sentience for however brief of a period it is. Because in D&D, you can re like animate like objects and give it an understanding. And then all of us decide and you're just like, and we take that away. And you are back to being a footstool. <laughs> like, or, or a tree yeah, with exactly. a broken heart. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But it doesn't matter anymore because he's not sentient. He's not even aware of himself. <laughs> but yeah, they get away from the tree. He's wandering off. And then uh, Molly Groove <laughs> finds him and sees the unicorn. And this is uh, the scene a bit we were alluding to earlier. She gets really emotional about seeing this unicorn re so late in life. And they don't really explain what this means, and this is kind of where I got, um, I kind of realized something about the movie. It's kind of, a lot of it's fairly impenetrable, because, like, I feel like you need to know a good bit about unicorn lore to understand what's going on here. Like, clearly this is a young, a young maiden seeing a unicorn means something, it means something in this universe. Yeah. But if you don't want, but if you don't know that, and I guess they're drawing that from, uh, real life myths but if you don't know that because you don't research unicorns all the time you don't understand the significance and you're only relating to it by the reaction of molly grew which is fairly well acted because this yeah this is... scene this scene was really powerful yeah. and and i like the notes i wrote was poor molly no idea why I feel badly for her. It doesn't address it. It doesn't really go into detail other than obviously she's been waiting a long time for the magic or the hope or whatever the unicorn is bringing her in this moment. She starts crying and then she forgives the unicorn right away. I'd like to touch on that because the way that she worded it, she uses the word virgin. So I feel like there's a, like a little bit of longing for some form of innocence at that point in time. And then like now that she's old and has seen the world for really what it was, which is medieval fantasy, like... I'm going to run off with brigands into the uh, random forest, like... Well, but medieval fantasy with, like, a real realistic kind of yeah. idea or understanding, because 
that doesn't work well for her. She's not made Marion in this situation. No. And she's and now, like scrubbing pots. Yeah, and like and, cooking like stew for these brigands. Absolutely. So then so then Brigands is a word, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Am I using it correctly, though? You oh, yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, you okay. Are. I just, I feel for Molly. I really, really do. And she's kind of prickly and she's kind of thorny. But unlike the unicorn, who I find very, like, flimsy in some parts of the movie, Molly has a backbone and she's seen stuff and she's more down-to-earth, kind of salt-of-the-earth yeah. person. But she, she's a romantic. She's an authentic woman of her approximate age is what yeah. yeah she's a you get the impression she's a real character tammy grimes is the actress she does a really good job and she doesn't look that old she's maybe like no. she's yeah. like, like 20s maybe or early years. early middle-aged i pegged I think her she's as. like 35 to 40 yeah. kind of in this universe yeah. where so, maybe 50 or 60 would be really old i just googled uh unicorns powers and abilities they gave me three uh, power to render poison water potable. Cool. Okay. Um, heal sickness. That happens, mm-hmm. kind of. And the third one is just has magical powers. <laughs> See? <laughs> that's, that's why she can unlock those locks. And, and you know what? Like, the part that you were talking about earlier, Cody, with the, like, the virgin impurity and innocence being attached to unicorns, that is, that is, like, real world yeah. lore. So I think, yeah, there is, while this universe is very unique, uh, what Kyle's been saying all along is that if you didn't know that, it wouldn't make sense. Like, if you mm-hmm. didn't know that those were, I don't know, virtues that were attached to unicorn lore, mm-hmm. then it wouldn't make sense for Molly to be all heartbroken about seeing the last unicorn. And I'm not going to hold it. I can't really mark points against it because I do, like, I, I've made my statements about like big prologues uh, info drops are it's almost better in some cases that the reader be a little bit more confused than have to sit through some boring prologue that's just gonna be stuff you can debatably figure out after this they wander around for a bit and then we encounter the red bull who's like a big ghostly bull and it starts drive uh, like hurting her essentially the unicorn and starts herding her toward the castle moat, or I guess it's in the lake, like the one in Black Cauldron was. Which, well, Which, once again, windy pathway up to the castle. It's like every animated movie yeah. has ever done has drawn a windy. <laughs> spindly, I mean, that way the army like, can't get in. Thing up to the drawbridge, and I'm like, why? Why do you have to do that? Like, can it just be a moat? Why does there have to be a windy pathway? It keeps the armies out. But yeah, uh, so she's getting chased around, and Smendrick just tells him, magic, do what you will. and that, Again. Yeah, and that uh, causes his magic to turn the unicorn into a human lady. Yeah, to abbreviate that, Molly's like, do something. Smendrick's like, magic, do what you will. And then afterwards, Molly's like, why did you do that? Yeah, th- this is like... <laughs> Okay, this isn't the smart thing to do. You did something, but you didn't. That technically fulfilled the goals you wanted to fulfill, but this isn't the optimal play. Yeah, but like his name's Smendrick. Do you really think he, he's like competent? Is the word I guess I'm looking for. I, the point of his character is that he isn't competent. He, that he's on his own path of discovery too. I guess right, and that's part of the reason why he's one of the one of the characters on this quest but but again it's very confusing because Molly tells him to do something because she wants to save the unicorn Smendrick does the thing that he did before and then when it happens everyone's angry at Smendrick. Yeah he's kind of kind of a weird character because normally in most fantasy novels he'd be a, this main male lead would be like late teens early 20s but he's I get the impression he's a bit older, mm-hmm. especially because they do pair him with Molly. Uh, Molly grew later in uh, later in the movie. I ship it. Yeah, so he gets so he does seem a bit older and is just like not youthful incompetence. It's just incompetence. Here, here's the thing. I'm gonna play the devil devil's advocate here. I like the idea that this guy is just like I have the power to conduct oh, like magic. I don't have the power to control magic. He's like, 
I'm going to do something, and if it benefits us for the better of the, the uh, overall journey or story arc, it's useful, right? Which also brings me back to the fact that it's magic, right? There's no set real... Yeah, soft magic system for this mm -hmm. guy. Definitely. Like, for example, in uh, Terry Goodkind's, uh, he wrote the wizard first, the, the wizard's first rule, which there's many of them, I think. I did read it at one point. It's been a while. They have the coolest wizard in it. His name is Zed Zedicus Zoolander. <laughs> Three Z names. <laughs> I like alliteration. <laughs> is that alliteration? Yep. Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah, but there's a, an actor like alliteration is the overarching term, and then there's a, like an. Uh, I don't know. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Don't get bogged down. Yeah, let's in that. not get bogged down. Onomatopoeia. Something onomatopoeia. Yeah. Onomatopoeia yeah. is okay, not. Yeah. No, that's not nope. onomatopoeia. Words. Nope. Onomatopoeia is word sounds. It's like bang. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For those grade eight <laughs> literature. Yeah. Teachers as you there? study from <laughs> home, let's give uh, you the worst English language arts class you could also, ever I'd, get. I'd like to point out that one of my English teachers was Victoria's mother, <laughs> and I think we actually covered that in her class. So. <laughs> okay, so before Cody made that really spindly point, Kyle was saying that it's interesting because Schmendrick is just kind of incompetent. And the first thing I thought was, he's like, if Cody were a magician, <laughs> Cody would just be Schmendrick. Yeah, Maybe, that's which cool. Is I, I, I would, I would definitely be the Schmendrick because, like, his name in Yiddish actually means fool, and he just kind of like happened upon. It's like Lucky as a feat in D and D. He's just kind of there, and he just kind of does stuff, right? Like, I don't know if that's a badge <laughs> of pride to wear. <laughs> Have you seen Domino in Deadpool? Schmendrick Luck is, is definitely a superpower. Schmendrick is different than Domino, though, because... Yeah, but it, it worked out for him. Okay. Everything works out for him. Barely. <laughs> He's coming up top. He Kyle, gets the girl. Save us. <laughs> Kyle, uh, save us. Help. Help. So yeah, um, yeah, they give him shit about turning the unicorn into a person with person feelings. Uh, <laughs> they mention that uh, if she stays in this form too long, they might not be able to turn her back because it's if she becomes a if she far starts feeling human feelings for too long, she'll actually become human instead of a unicorn in a human's body. So makes perfect sense. Yeah, it it means not. Thing and just they like, change it back, even though she starts feeling human feelings later in the movie. I like I like that you're saying human feelings, like as opposed to squirrel it, feelings or Red Bull feelings or unicorn feelings. Is this the human feel emotion known as madness? Exactly. <laughs> and then Schmendrick gives her a name, which I also would like to name my second born this. Um she starts going by the Lady Amelthea at this point, and so I'm going to have uh, my son be named Schmendrick and my daughter be named Amalthea. Yeah. I wonder this, if this annoyed Amalthea me. It was just like Jewish. It's it's just a really impronounceable name, which I don't like in my fantasy. It always it it was. I mean, Black Cauldron was kind of. This movie was okay for this up to now, but this is the really bad one. Everything else is pronounceable. This is hard. She has to have a magical princess name, just like yeah. every other magical princess. So, please, Kyle, I say mean, it with me. Amelthia. Amelthia. We. They. I mean, they, the, 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 the most Amelthia. other. Most other princesses have uh, pronounceable names. Alora. Uh, Cinderella. Cinder. Yeah, Cinderella. Like, That's Cinderella a word you can a, pronounce. Okay. Uh, I, I, not, Rapunzel. Yeah. Like, Rapunzel. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's German. It's perfectly pronounceable. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, they um continue on. They take on to the wa they head to they find King Haggard's castle. We get a bit of an ominous shot of the water as they're crossing the bridge. It's like weirdly ominous in this moment where the where the print where the unicorn is just at like her darkest moment and they're staring at the water for a long time. And I know it's foreshadowing, because spoiler, that's where they're keeping the unicorns, sort of. But it's just, like, really weird that, like, in this dark moment, she's looking at this large dip into the water. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, her eyes stay the exact same from when she was a unicorn. She's got the same eyes yeah. as yeah. a human. Like, mm -hmm. once again, going back to the uh, anime style, like, almost anime style, large eye type it's very pretty. She's it very is. pretty. Yeah. 
Another consequences of this a consequence of this is that she's been turned mortal by this, which is mm-hmm. another thing that made me nervous about looking Ooh, at the water. Yeah, and sorry, I I kind of I hadn't written this down, but I do want to talk about how she was turned mortal, and we we kind of touched upon like Schmendrick can't do anything right, and that was like a haha jokey moment, but she's turned mortal, and even before she gets her new name as like Lady Amalthea, which again is very funny. Um, she she says like I can feel this body dying, right, and and you think that that's going to mean something later on, right, but. To me, looking at it now as an adult, and this isn't something I would have picked up as a kid, but she was, like, her body was totally transformed and manipulated without her say-so, right? Like, she didn't say, please save me from the Red Bull. Yeah. That was Molly saying, save her, save her. And then Schmedrick tries, but she doesn't like the result of it. And it it's kind of, she's very vulnerable and it was it was it was yeah this was a really dark moment yeah and i don't know that before this she can really she really has the capacity to understand what death is yeah. like anything that like she's gonna be like in a like any thing the red bull could have done to her in her mind is probably just like an inconvenient little spot that would so be difficult here's for my bit. thought on it um she deserves it uh <laughs> Okay, we're okay, we're about okay, to okay, fight. Okay, okay. okay. just let it, hold on. <laughs> Earlier on in the film, she is always flaunting her immortality. She's like, "I'm immortal. You're not. We're all immortal. You're gonna die one day. I'm not gonna die." Like she's very in your face about the fact that she is immortal and other people are mortal. So, the fact that at one point in time, I can say. How's that uh, non-existent plot armor anymore? You're no longer immortal. Okay, I'm gonna... I acknowledge your point, but I don't care how for <laughs> how you put that. And I'm going to I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit and reframe it, kind of where my thoughts were going when I said she was really vulnerable. Like her her body was violated without her consent, right? And so her whole being was shifted from one being to another. And if you look at that with like themes of you know, feminism and women's rights, then, then all of a sudden it's a different story. Right. And so Mm -hmm. she, her personality, I've said she's hard to like throughout the whole thing, but I don't think that means that she deserves being tampered with in that (coughs) way. Right. Especially, especially when you start thinking about it with those kind of more grown up Mm -hmm. like themes and, and undercurrents and maybe that lens of, you know, as a woman, I'm thinking, holy shit, like, she she just went, underwent this huge procedure without being asked, and it's kind of icky, and so then we we introduce themes of death, but we also introduce themes of, like, body agency and the woman's right to her body, right? And so so when you say something like that, I'm like, whoa, like, pump the brakes a little bit, but granted, I hadn't given you that perspective yet, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of dangled it there. I <laughs> kind of started I, picking up on it as soon as I said it, but yeah. like, I, 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 I think it's Cody's a different tra- yeah. train of thought yeah. in the, storytelling. Yeah, right? the point. Uh, I'm not. Looking I think for the what symbolism. you maybe were trying to get at in a clunky way is that this was her being brought down from a point of hubris. Yes, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah, we know that uh, they come up to the gates of the castle. And also, the guys they yeah. didn't do the funny animal thing where they're like, "You were a frog a few seconds ago. Let's shoot my tongue out a red bug and eat it." I well, think because it's, it's not yeah. a kids movie. I like, think it, okay. I think it would have been distracting for the well, serious like, moment. But, yeah. A few seconds where she's like, "I am a horse." Clop de clop clop. Because like. This isn't the, the Little uh, Mermaid did it, did yeah. they not? Where they're like, "Oh, I have yeah. feet now. Look at my feet." And yeah, this isn't. Had, like, this isn't. Uh, like, this isn't Equestria Girls. I'm. I'm glad that you brought up the Little Mermaid though, because this definitely has elements of the mm-hmm. Little Mermaid in it, where it's kind of a darker version of Ariel getting legs, right? That yeah. that Ariel signed that contract knowingly. Mm-hmm. Um, Amalfia <laughs> didn't, yeah. and so. So we're kind of getting a darker, seedier version of that story, maybe more akin to the original mm-hmm. Little Mermaid story, right? Kind of again, Grand's fairy tales, yeah, like to... that very dark fairy tale. Yeah. Which I, as an adult, I'm I'm finding that I had more 
interest in than when I watch this 90 times as a child. So yeah, on to the plot. She, uh, yeah, they come to the ga castle gates and two guys are guarding it. They're just like, who goes there? What's your purpose? And he's like, uh, where I'm a wizard. I'm hoping to do some stuff. I'll only talk to what I want to say to the king. And they then, then take him to the throne room and the <laughs> king takes off his helmet and is just like, oh yeah, I'm the king. Yeah, and he's like... For some reason. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a power move. It's like... <laughs> yeah, but then he immediately admits that he only has four guards. <laughs> like, by... by Which we don't see. Logistics, just... like, if we had four people and then somebody invaded us with eight people, <laughs> we are automatically outmanned. I mean, like, it's two a, more people. It's a very well-placed castle. They probably have good uh, defense. It's probably fairly defensible, though you don't have anything that... Yeah, and I'm not going to get into this. You uh, also have a magical, angry red bull in your basement, yeah. so, I mean, that might count for Can something. the red bull hurt I don't know, magical <laughs> beings? I don't know if that was ever stated. It yeah. seems to be spectral. Yes, it can. Though. It yeah. can, because it ran down what's-his-face. Anyway, yeah. we'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. Um, yeah, he, uh, he's, he gives, uh, his evil motivation, which is, uh, yeah, he's played with Christopher Lee, by the way, who's great. He does a he's, good job. Yeah, yeah he's... Uh, one of the, the author who came in and did the screenplay said Christopher Lee was probably the most literate actor he's ever met, where Christopher Lee was actually taking a copy of his book and going in, in lines and going, I want to say this, I want to say this, I want to cut this, I want to cut I've this. I've heard reports like, like that from the Lord of the Rings shoot, too. Cause, Lord yeah. of the Rings, uh, Christopher Lee read The Hobbit and the whole Lord of the Rings yeah. trilogy once a year since, like, 19... He is one of my favorite <laughs> actors, because he's always, like, this great, awesome, epic fantasy villain. He's always, like, Dracula or Saruman or... And he's uh, got <clears throat> gravitas. Like, yeah. he definitely lends an air of power and fear to mm. King Hagrid, who... Hagrid? No, Hagrid. Hagrid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> King Hagrid. Oh my goodness, that's That'd a... That'd be a very different a, novel. <laughs> that would be a very different <laughs> fanfic. <laughs> Sorry, King Hagrid and... Yo, Wizard Harry. <laughs> I can see it because, a unicorn. because Hagrid would be like, oh, I, w I just want all the unicorns to myself. Let's get this giant bull to run him into the ocean ah! for me. And he'd be, like, he'd be yeah. like out there taking care of him. And it'd be a very different story because like, our it's next, Hagrid. <laughs> our next uh, show is going to be us reading uh, Harry Potter slash The Last <laughs> Unicorn fanfic where Hagrid is the king and... It's care of magical creatures class in this decrepit Hogwarts building. Oh my goodness, I love it so much already. So yeah, he, uh, yeah, he, uh, King Haggard makes the point that he only surrounds himself with stuff that makes him happy. Um, which we figure out is why he's been capturing the unicorns is because it makes him happy having them in a magic thing. Ocean yeah, you want to want to talk about want to talk about those feminist the yeah. themes there, boys? <laughs> yeah, that is something there. <laughs> I guess that, now that you're mentioning it, yeah, this is though. I imagine, though they're probably are all unicorns female. I don't is that established? I think I think in this iteration, yes, I would assume that yeah. they're young, pure, yeah. feminine, maybe yeah. not female, but yeah. feminine creatures and definitely represent like yeah. maidenhood, right? So yeah, I, I mean, even just for him going after her, right? Like yeah. the the idea that he's this old man who wants to possess her in her truest form and all of her purity, it's, it's creepy. Yep. It's creepy. Uh, yeah, I see your point there. Smendrick says that he wants to take the job of his court munition and introduces uh, the unicorn as his niece. Um, and Molly Grew is, I guess, I don't know what he introduces her as. I think he but, says the cook. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Let's talk about um, feminist icons there. We've got one on one hand, a unicorn princess, and then on the other hand, somebody who's doing dishes in a dungeon. Who's yeah. Any, who does have agency in this? So she's, she does have a lot of this agency. This does pass the, what's it called? Bechtel test. Bechtel test. I, Bechtel I, I test? think. I'm I not sure. I, I think it, it does. I was going to look it up, though. Because two I, or more 
female characters. They don't talk about boys. Or they talk about stuff other than boys. Other than guys, yeah. So, uh, there's a website, I know. I think it does off the top of my head. Bechteltest.com will tell us if this passes. I I would imagine it does because I feel like Molly and her talk about other things. But then I'm also like... Well, does it? We do have. Well, the, uh, do they talk about Prince Lear at any point in time? They do because that would be two women talking I don't about know if boys. They, I don't know. If no, if, but they they talk about other things though. That's the point. Uh, yeah. Okay. Where yeah, it's know? it's about uh, not being limited to rather than exclusively. But yeah, he Smendrick offers himself as the court mage. We're then introduced to the actual court mage, who is this master magician. He's and Kagger's just like. You know what? Having a master magician hasn't really brought me much joy. Maybe I will try an incompetent one. See if that makes me. See if that gets me happy. And then the master mage is out of the story for the rest of the movie, which is weird. Like big <laughs> magical man <laughs> disappearing out of nowhere. You'd think he'd pop back up later. Yeah. Well, he does kind of serve his purpose of foreshadowing the king's demise. And also, uh, he's a pretty good character foil to Schmendrick, who seems to yeah. be very much more competent. It in does. It does establish. It does establish that there are competent mages. Mm-hmm. It does. Okay, sorry. Uh, the definitive answer to whether or not the last unicorn passes the Bechtel test, which the rules are, it has to have at least two named women mm-hmm. in it. So we've got the Princess Amelia, or yeah. or. Uh, what was it? I'm counting four named Kate, women. Amalthea uh, and Molly, for sure, yep. mm-hmm. who talk to each other about something besides a man. So those two women talk about uh, the unicorns and age, and this has nothing to do with men. So yep. it would it would pass the Bechdel yep. test. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, the the uh, mage, I think, notices that... Uh, uh, he yeah he calls out that Amalfia is a unicorn. She's going or not that she's a unicorn, but that she'll be the doom of King Haggard. So we're talking about and then names. disappears. What do you classify as a name? Because she's not given a name up until halfway through the movie, and the name itself was just something made up, right? I think like Amalfia. the last the last unicorn is kind of her name because it's like main character and unicorns don't have names in this yeah. fantasy world. So And it's not up until she's human that she's actually given a name, so Yeah. Which so is, is that I don't I think in this context where <laughs> I think no, we're under, overlooking I it. think <laughs> in this context where she normally wouldn't have a name under normal circumstances, I don't think it would be fair to as, as the only woman yeah. on this panel debating this, I'll allow it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, Haggard's actually pretty scary. He's like a, re- a really haggard old man, hence the name. Uh, we also meet the, his uh, son, Prince Lear, who's played by Jeff Bridges, who is just not on board with anything. He's just not talking like a fantasy character. He's just talking like Jeff Bridges. But once which again, he me. was really on board for this movie. Like, oh yeah, super. But he on doesn't board. talk like a fantasy Offered character. Offered to do it for free. There's maybe like one scene where he's talking like a fantasy character, and maybe when he's singing. But normal, otherwise, he talks like a normal person. And this and is he's like, the only person in the this movie. Is who does 1987 it. Jeff Bridges. 82. 87. 82. 82. Is it 82? Yep. yep. I might be thinking yeah. The Hobbit again. Yeah. Um. Anyways, he was a big name back then. Yeah. Like he he did a, a Star Is Born. He did a couple of westerns. Was he the guy from Tron? He might have been. I forget who's in Tron. He he was actually. Uh, <clears throat> I I like his character. Like I like Prince Lear because Prince Lear is a stand up guy in the end. We laugh out loud so hard when he goes on his little <clears throat> quest to impress the Lady Amalfia and comes back with this dragon's head and she's not impressed. And he's like, please, lady, let me help you. And it was just... he Speaking about how he's not talking in medieval terms, he does use please, lady, but it was so, like old school boy band the music kicked in right at that point it was hilarious he is just like oddly just the biggest badass in this movie like he's like canonically kills like several monsters 
and and becomes this big hero, and then he's all like. I want to impress her, and Molly Grew tells him, well, maybe you just need to be yourself, and then he tries to write poetry. He he canonically kills, like, dragons and trolls and ogres, and he's just, like, this weirdly stereotypical knight that's just really good at his job. And, and Lady Amalthea is just having none of it, like, totally not impressed, yeah. and that it was fantastic. Please, lady, let me help you. It's yeah. just so this oh, this so gets good. I'm gonna get to this point now. Uh, there t- he's he asks uh, Molly Rue a little bit of advice toward uh, Amalfia, and he's just like, oh yeah, maybe you should do something, something, something to help impress her. I'm like, why are you encouraging this? She is a horse. Like you know what he's going, body. yeah, but she's going to turn back eventually. And Molly like, is a romantic. That's why she's encouraging it. Yeah. And and Molly With, goes uh, to but, talk to Amalfia to say, maybe just pay him some attention. He's trying so hard to get to know you. So just I think, think she's just a romantic. She, yeah, she wants, but eventually they're going to have to deal with the fact that this woman is a horse. Their love is forbidden. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, exactly. technically, <laughs> literally, because you're not supposed to have relationships with horse. By laws of nature. Yeah, but yes. it's not a, she's not a horse, she's a unicorn. It's a lot because she's a unicorn. That's exactly. A she would be really she, mad at you she, for calling her a horse right now. Yeah, exactly. Yes. She a unicorn, has it's not, self-awareness. She's allowed to make these choices A unicorn herself. is different from a horse in the sense that a, hor- <laughs> that a human is different from an elf. It's just a hu- it's just a horse with stuff added on. It's still like it, it, you're not if you're like you're not realistically going to be like, whoa, "Oh whoa. yeah, you know, I'll uh, have a relationship with a horse, but a, a unicorn." Kyle, Kyle, <laughs> well, you're are, great, sir. <laughs> Kyle, are you suggesting that humans and elves can have sex? What is wrong with you? Oh my goodness, I am shocked and appalled. <laughs> I was expecting them to, like, turn him into a horse by the end yeah. of this or something. <laughs> See, that's like, what I thought, too, is that, like, well, it's a kid's a, movie, so they're going to be like, oh, well, the, you, you helped the unicorns, so the unicorns are going to help you now, and now you're a horse. Yeah. Bam. Your love can be <laughs> fulfilled. But, like, apparently it was... No, yeah. Prince there gets the shit end of this stick. Yeah. And he's a really stand-up guy because he doesn't stop her. He's like... I know you've got a quest to go on, and I know that you need to be, like, to fulfill that. He talks about you can't have a happy he- end in the middle of a story. And so he's really quite, you know, feminist. He, he lets her go and do yeah. her and have her agency back. He, right? he does, when he does figure out that she is a unicorn, she's just like, hey, you could tell me that she's a mermaid or a sorcerer. I'd still be good for it. So he's clear, at least at least he's okay with this idea. He accepts her for all it, that she is. That would have been really awkward if and, like, he got, she got turned like, back to a horse and then he didn't love, love her, her anymore. Her that would have been obviously worse. The physical. Exactly. Yeah. Love is complicated. And... <laughs> And that's kind of what he's saying. And Kyle, she if you want to love a horse, you can love a horse. Oh, God, I that's don't want not to. what we're no. no, no, Kyle. No, no. There are some laws. Elves no. and humans cannot be together. Horses and humans cannot be together. It, Unicorns yeah. and humans. Well, yeah, we're a little all in all, this is that. This is the more comf- uncomfortable of the two coarse human romances I've seen in, lit- in any media. What other horse human romances are we talking Dragon about? Dragon Quest Eight. the guy's... Uh, um, the main character, his, uh, he's in love with the princess who gets cursed and tur- is turned into a horse. Oof. So she's a horse and a she's a human in a horse's body. So like, yeah, they he kind of has also, a relationship with a horse. Wasn't there a queen of I, I want to say England? I know this is maybe canon. I don't know if it's actually correct. Uh, wasn't there a queen who died from... The- no, no, that's not real. No? That's Kay. Queen Catherine from Also Russia. Russia, yeah. And also, okay. did you just refer to history as canon? <laughs> yes. Like, is this historically accurate? Could be now, is it canon? I don't think that's the proper usage. We're just doing... So not canon? No, not <laughs> canon. Also not historically accurate. It was a rumor. Okay. Because... I don't know. It's yeah, well, weird. anyway. We're really covering a lot yeah. of bases in this episode. Yeah, we're about to. This, hour this is now. also why we have a uh, restricted rating on Spotify yeah. and yeah. stuff like you mean that. Explicit? It's, explicit, yeah, because yeah. there's swear words in it. That's why I put it on for. That's also, fine. we review our R-rated movies occasionally. Not this week, but 
So we're getting towards the end of the plot where Amalthea is trying to decide if she wants to stay human or turn back into a unicorn to save the day and free the other unicorns, right? Is that where we Yeah, were? uh... No, we yeah, were um, talking about, like, let's the, see. We're, we're, we're still in I'm the I'm going to go through my notes here. here. Idiot Prince cuts himself. Uh... <laughs> I don't know what that line's about. Weird bestiality themes. <laughs> um, I make a, oh yeah, I make a point here that I kind of, the songs are actually kind of dull. They just kind of describe what's happening on uh, on screen. It does sound good, but I don't know that there's much uh, lyrical meat to it. Oh, here's the next plot point: the uh, Molly Grew meets with a, is meet, talking in the kitchen to this random talking pirate oh, cat right. with one leg. Uh, I think this is where, yeah. this is well, where I went for my smoke because I don't remember any of this. I am um, also it was between the uh, what we call it the prince's love montage <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah. I'm done. Leave for a smoke. Come back five minutes later. Different song and, and it's the it's a uh, Amalfia having a crisis about musical number re loving the prince about the, loving the okay, prince. Okay, okay, yeah. So they've gotten the prince loving the princess yeah. montage, and now we've got the princess. They've, yeah, they've made the, the prince. Whole, they've made uh, the unicorn feel human's emotion, <laughs> which Smendrick said not to make her do, just because that would make it harder for her to turn back. Yes, because uh, Smendrick knows so much about magic. Okay, yeah. going back onto this, he gave the princess abilities to feel emotions. And he gave the tree the ability to, like... Feel emotions? Not feel emotions, but be self-aware of itself that it's not just a tree. Which one do you think is more damaging? <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, the, the cat's weird. It tells her, like, uh, riddles about what to do. And he's just like... And when Molly grew, just like, why are you telling me wizards? He's just like, cats are confusing by nature. Which, fair. I've got a few cats that are confused yeah. by nature. One just knocked over a plant yeah. today. I, I did notice that, uh, I did, I make the note that, like, Prince Lear, is this a King Lear prequel? I think <laughs> the idea was that King Haggard was supposed to be kind of a King Lear-ish character, and then, like, tragic and, and all of that. And so Prince Lear is maybe an homage to those illusions. That's what I was picking up on. The so. Prince, uh... Is talk uh, makes start uh, talks to the unicorn for a little bit, and she's just uh, he's just making a point like, hey, you're not really her niece, because uh, you're clearly noble born because reasons. It's kind of an, his one ignorant comment. Because you're the beautiful thing. and you've got these sparkly eyes, which is never something that uh, peasant girls have. Aw, uh, those poor peasant girls. Uh, I mean, it, AKA me. Which it does. It does. He does kind of. We kind of kind of do get like an irony about this because you, uh, King Haggard, does reveal that he's not really his son, and that he just adopted him because he figured like, hmm, maybe being a father will bring me joy. Yeah, that was really calloused. He was like, maybe being a father will bring me joy. Yeah. It wore off in a few years. <laughs> like, the novelty. <laughs> it was nice at first, but then it, like... I'm honestly surprised uh, Prince Lear turned out as well as he did. Yeah, I... Yeah, yeah he's just totally. like Yeah, he's like a stand-up guy who's also, like, just Hercules in, his, Hercules in his spare time. I feel like he also has this almost... He's killed dragons. Yeah. He's killed giants. He's and nobody is like, "Hey, good job, champ." Nobody is like, he gets zero gratification throughout this whole yeah, entire. His, his dad's movie. not giving him a son of the year. Yeah, no validation at all. Like, he doesn't even zero. really get the girl at the no. end. That's just like, uh, but he goes on to hit, live a happy life, and that's yeah. good for him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They um. They're guided by. They're told by the cat to visit this uh, character called Skull, who's a skeleton, which is weird. Who they have to trick into letting, guiding them toward where the unicorns are. They succeed, but then the skeleton realizes that uh, she, the unicorn, is a unicorn, and starts calling Haggard. Haggard uh, arrives at the scene. He attacks Bendrick as the two women escape through the clock portal, which is where they were hiding the Red Bull. Ha uh, Smendrick apparently gets gets cut, 
which we don't see the blood again. Lear sneaks in at some point. He's just skipping this part of the scene, just shows up in the climax. Yeah, I don't know. He's like... It's really weird because Schmendrick asks, well, how did you get here? And he's like, oh, I followed her. Yeah, yeah, I was following you. <laughs> and I did nothing to help while you guys were being attacked, but I just I just followed you. I got cut. It's no big deal. You didn't need help. I, I mean, I'm just the terrible wild magic sorcerer. You're uh, like the level 20 fighter. And it's like, you know, we don't need me. You don't, you don't need to step in to Aww. do some fighting. <laughs> Schmendrick. <laughs> Lear urges them forward. They find the bull. Smendrick gets a good line here where just, like, they're debating what to do because they don't know if they'll be able to beat the Red Bull. And he's just like, hey, maybe we can't get you back to normal, princess. You gotta... Maybe you just marry Prince Lear and just live happily ever after. And she's just just like... They make a point where just like, eh, that's not really a happy ending. And he's like, there's no happy endings. There's no endings. Which is a fun little historical line. I think... I mean, that's the philosophy kind of behind Game of Thrones and why Game of Thrones didn't end up having a good ending toward the end is because it's not set up to end. It's just set up to continue on forever. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. that's a good argument. Yeah. And and I do, like, I think that Schmendrick shows some wisdom in in the ending kind of as the, as the climax is happening and towards, like, he also has that good line with Prince Lear where they're like... Uh, Molly and the prince are trying to urge Schmendrick to do something to help the unicorn because what happens is they go down this tunnel uh, and the Red Bull identifies her as a woman so Schmendrick changes her back into a unicorn and uh, Molly and and the prince are like you need to help her with magic and Schmendrick says to the prince that's what heroes are for. And so he gets involved. And- I think I've kind of had a revelation about uh, Smendrick's magic is that the moral is that magic is bullshit and doesn't actually need to work. Uh, like, he can't be a master wizard because then mas- he'd solve everyone's problems. That's fair. Uh, and and I think that's, again, kind yeah. of the theme. One of the mature themes of this story is that, like, a fairy tale is what you're going to make it. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, so they have to... The unicorn gets turned back into a unicorn. She's chasing... uh, She's running away from the Red Bull, who's trying to chase her into the sea with the other unicorns. The prince... Yeah, after the hero line, the prince decides to stand up to the uh, bull, and he is seemingly killed. Yeah, Um, this is where we realize that the bull can impact humans and mortals, not just magical creatures, because he kills Prince Lear. And then mm-hmm. the unicorn realizes that she has to stand up f- to the bull. And, and I love this moment because yeah. she she does it because she is in love with Prince Lear. So if she hadn't had the experience of being a woman yeah. and falling in love, then she maybe wouldn't have felt think- compelled to act. So he falls, and that's when she starts get- becoming offensive. Like, she starts on the offense as to challenge the Red Bull. I think what happens here is uh, what she, what I think magic needed her to do which is why, I think this is why the magic turned her into a human. She needed to learn mortality in order to understand fighting for uh, fighting for your life and fighting for something. Because before she's immortal, nothing you do to her is going to be any more than a temporary inconvenience. That's what I think with the scene with the in the circus was meant to illustrate. It's like you can contain these immortal creatures, but it's not going to hurt hurt her in the long run. I can't read that. I've been uh, drawing comics. Yeah. yeah, the the moral is like she didn't uh she doesn't need to f- an immortal doesn't need to deal with problems. The problems will just go away eventually. The mort- uh, her becoming mortal made her realize that she needed to fight to accomplish her goal and free the other unicorns. So she then stands up to the Red Bull and uh, drives it into the ocean, mm-hmm. which causes the uh, unicorns to come out. And then they cause the castle to collapse, because of course it did. Yep, and um, awful King Haggard falls into yep. the water, into a yep. watery death below. Yep. It's kind of, uh, once again, tokenish, mm-hmm. because in token there was Arwen, 
who was an elven lady. And then there was Aragon, who was a mortal man. And Arwen ended up giving up her immortality to be with Aragon. If you've never watched The Lord of the Rings, that's kind of something that happens in it. This one is kind of not the same because she's like, I'm going straight back to being immortal, bitches. <laughs> Peace is out. So. <laughs> but yeah, um, so that's the end of the movie. The unicorns are free. Everyone ends up going their separate ways. Smendrick and Molly Grew get together. And they're so cute and I love yeah. it. He's like, Molly, will you come with me? And she's like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> makes me very happy <laughs> they deserve each other yeah. they really do they balance each other i don't out well. i don't need to kneel down to kiss you <laughs> That's, okay uh. so i don't know like i um was very surprised about uh. watching this movie as an adult yeah, yeah i guess we'll just give a you give your rating first sure yeah as a as a kid man i would have given this movie like a two maybe Two out of ten, because I was scared of it. Like, the harpy freaked me out. The Red Bull gave me nightmares. And my little sister, who is a little creepier than I am, she loved it. So we watched it so many times that it just, it lost its kind of appeal. You know how, like, when you're a kid, you're watching something that's a little bit older. It was kind of exciting the first yeah. time. We watched this movie so many times that I didn't even have that anymore. And so as a child, I probably would have given it about a two out of ten. Like, I would have much rather watch something Disney-ish and happy-go-lucky. As an adult, though, the more I thought about... Like, the themes, the environmental, the feminist themes going throughout it. Um, I really appreciated it on a different level. The voice acting is excellent. The screenplay is well done. The music, I actually don't mind. I think it is a little repetitive because it kind of plays the same thing throughout the whole movie. But it's quite pretty. Yes, it matches. I uh, touch on that. They did the uh, the Highlander treatment. Yeah. Where they took the Highland like the T V show Highlander had like a score done by Queen and then it's just like completely overshadowed by Queen's like professional like career Work. and such like that. But like yeah, America I've listened to America. They're not like a huge name, but they are pretty decent. I think I read somewhere that it was a score done by like your coolest uncle's favorite 1970s band or something like that okay. and it kind of is right like i'm thinking yeah. of my uncle brian shout out to uncle brian who is the coolest person of that generation i can think of and i'm, I'm positive he listens to this kind of music so i think the music was well done the animation is beautiful like i really do love the art of the movie so i realized as an adult even though i had these <laughs> repressed memories of being forced to watch this movie over and over again and really not excited about watching it again as an adult that I liked it way better than I expected. So I think it's somewhere between like hmm, a seven and a half, maybe an eight. I don't think I would want to watch it on repeat ever, but as a favor to my younger sister, I would probably watch it again. All right, go to your show. I'd, I'd like to think maybe uh, about a six out of ten and here's my uh, reasoning behind that. D sure, it has a lot of, like, iconic symbolism, as Victoria was saying earlier, that maybe was kind of sort of lost on me, because I... Because he it, tuned it out and he went for a smoke. It's because they played up so, like, feministic that it, it's almost like I zone out of it, because it wouldn't have appealed to me as a kid. And so, with that being said... You know, I missed a lot of the things that was brought in up later on, as you can tell. So yeah, I'm going to rate it a little lower. And yeah. I stand by it. It's not a necessarily a bad thing. Alright. Uh, 9 out of 10. Oh, I so <laughs> knew he was going to have the highest one! <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I gave it a lot. I I gave, I gave it a lot of shit, but it's. I mean, this is why. I, I was mentioning this earlier. This is why we do the number scores. In addition to like our regular commentary, is so that we can give it a little bit more, more make, love. Yeah, make more, sh give it more shit, and talk, talk a lot more about it. But yeah, it's really good. I don't know if I'd watch it again, but I think it's really decent. 
I think it's like an a, adult movie, like yeah. an adult film. Yeah. Well, not that kind of adult film. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a, a movie meant for adult audiences. It's well done. But for, like, I would not want my kids watching I, this. Yeah, I probably wouldn't bring it, uh, bring this to a kid, necessarily. It's maybe, yeah, it's probably a little, vi it's probably a little violent, or not violent, but it's got, like, a little bit too much scary imagery for younger children. But, yeah, I think it's good for, like, as an adult watching it for the first time. I think it turned out pretty good. I knew Maybe. you were going to have the highest yeah. rating out of all of us yeah. as soon as you were like, I, I like that butterfly. This was this was a this was a case where I talked myself up to from an 8 till a 9 to, throughout the course of the review. Mm -hmm. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. I, I definitely had a lower review written down, but the more we <clears> talked <throat> about theme and the more we talked about the purpose of everything kind of being done, the lore that you brought up, it was like, oh, I actually did enjoy watching that more than I thought I did. And a lot of the stuff where it is impenetrable, I'm not going to hold against it, because I, th I do have faith that it's actually there, that there is answers to my questions. It's not like, oh, it's just clearly just pulling this out of the ether. It's not, no, this is clearly drawing from, like, um, a lot of research and heavy reading and or more source material that yeah. we just didn't get from the yeah. like from the movie itself if we wanted to go out and pick up the book itself and go hey let's read the book it might have a lot of things that we'll maybe sometime in the future the i will read the book yeah uh sometime after i've gone through my pile of novels which isn't too tall it isn't too tall right now it's just two books right now but well, the the other kind of speaking to this point, I like that it trusts the audience to find those answers too, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we don't need to know exactly why Molly was so upset by finding the unicorn this late in her life, but we can kind of fill in that blank ourselves with our adult brains, right? And mm -hmm. and I like movies that trust their audience and, and assume that you're smart enough to figure out some of those questions for yourself. So I appreciated that too. I think we'll start wrapping it up. So where can people uh, follow you on the social medias and whatnot? The social medias? Are you like an 80-year-old man? Oh my goodness. He's 80 years old and his favorite movie is now The Last Unicorn. <laughs> Kyle, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> no, my um, my name is Victoria Coops and I'm actually a young adult author. I am working on my own kind of uh, fantasy-inspired D&D-ish novel getting that ready to submit for publication so you can find me online on the social media as kyle said uh facebook at victoria coops rights and instagram at victoria coops rights as well as uh, twitter at victoria coops i also have a website it's www.victoriacoops.com so please come on over say hi follow like and uh tell me what you thought about the last unicorn when you see this hit my social media pages. Uh, as always, you can find us, our Twitter at KC Cinema Pod, and our Facebook at Kyle and Cody's Cult Cinema Cast. Just to spoil you for next week, we are doing a review. Of, we are, we are, for next week, we are starting our visit to our sub theme of the season, which is Razzie movies that aren't actually that bad. Which uh, I don't know if this one's going to be actually good. It's uh, Daddy's Home. Starring no, Adam Big Sandler. Daddy. Big Daddy. Star it is Big Daddy starring Adam Sandler. Which, I don't know if this one will actually be good. But it is uh, earlier from his career, so it might still be okay. So yeah, that'll be the first of that season. See, that's kind of the Adam Sandler effect. Like, as soon as people were like, Adam Sandler's really bad. I don't know if he... Like, <laughs> I don't know if I actually ever enjoyed a movie of Adam Sandler after the fact that somebody was like, this really isn't that great. Like, I don't know, Fifty First Dates is okay, isn't it? Yeah, I've seen that, it's all right. I like Drew Barrymore, I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she makes that movie. My sister watches uh, the Eight Crazy Nights every year. Okay, okay. Uh, that one might actually hold up, just yeah. because it's animated. It doesn't. <laughs> no, it no. doesn't. No, I don't uh, care for it too Or was much. that Grandma's Got... No, that was the song. It it's also a song. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that I've seen. What was the last fucking Adam Sandler movie I see? I think I saw Grown Ups. Grown Ups, yeah. Um, Are we reviewing Adam Sandler <laughs> movies right now? No. Because if not, like. No, I don't think we have time for Thanks for having this. me on, yeah. guys. Yeah. It's been a slice. Yeah. I'm going to leave now. Yeah, we'll get you okay. on for season two, I think, I at some point. Yeah. All right.
Bye, guys.